Four months after confessing to the murders of Merid Malarick and Karen Farrell, Eugene Paul Clausen recanted. He said he made the whole thing up in a foolish attempt to somehow escape one justice by avoiding another. How did he concoct such an elaborate tale? According to Clausen, a detective magazine like this one. Cheap, plentiful, lurid, and usually very descriptive. In Morgantown, prosecuting attorney David Solomon isn't buying it. He says Clausen is attempting an end run around justice and has already confessed to things that only the killer would know. The defense claims Clausen is the product of a troubled life and although deranged, is also a clever fantasist. In the proud tradition of the justice system, the decision of guilt or innocence will be left up to a jury of Clausen's peers or, in this case at least, two of them. When most of the world first heard the name Eugene Paul Clausen, six long years had passed since the night Merritt Malarick and Karen Farrell had vanished. Three months later, Clausen was indicted for the murders, not quite six years to the day after the girls' lifeless bodies had been found. For West Virginia as a whole, and Morgantown in particular, the details which emerged were stomach-churning. Three months of hope and searching ended abruptly on April 16, 1970. That day, the fate of Merritt and Karen was finally revealed. Both had been killed the same night they disappeared, their deaths made even more unpalatable by the heinous atrocities inflicted upon their bodies. Each young lady's head had been removed, whether pre- or post-mortem, no one knew. In fact, no one could even really be certain just how the girls had been killed. Aside from the obvious trauma above the shoulders, no other injuries or blemishes could be found. The lack of information was beyond frustrating. No one knew how the two girls had gotten to the location where they were found. No one knew of anyone who had a motive to kill either girl. No one saw or heard anything the night they vanished, save for vague descriptions of a large, light-colored car and a white male. The months of uncertainty had brought out the best in some and the worst in others. As law enforcement struggled to make sense out of the disturbing events, public patience wore thin, resulting in a cascade of criticism and second-guessing. The public at large, especially the girls' family and friends, all wanted answers. The resulting silence was frustratingly deafening. By the end of 1970, the trail had gone cold and would remain in suspended animation until January of 1976. Almost six years to the day after the young co-eds had vanished, word came from a jail in New Jersey that one of their inmates, one of their more unique inmates, had apparently made a startling jailhouse confession. He was the one who had kidnapped and then murdered Merritt Malarick and Karen Farrell. Though naturally skeptical, authorities from West Virginia could not ignore the abrupt confession and followed up. Their pursuits led them to 36-year-old Eugene Paul Clausen, who, in graphic detail, would go on to vividly describe the events of six years previous. In short, Clausen stated that the night the two co-eds vanished, he had been cruising the streets of Morgantown and picked the pair up while hitchhiking. Clausen stated he was under the influence of narcotics at the time, but did remember taking the girls hostage, driving them several miles south of Morgantown, and physically assaulting them. Clausen said he next killed each girl, severed their heads to make identification more difficult, fled the area, and disposed of the girls' heads in a mine shaft near his childhood home. 
As Clawson was not the first to have claimed responsibility for Merritt and Karen's deaths, the West Virginia State Police, as well as the Monongalia County Prosecutor's Office, moved cautiously. Their initial on-the-record interview with Clawson on January 13, 1976, was soon followed up by several other interviews, interrogations, and one-on-one sessions. On January 27th, Clawson willingly volunteered to submit to a polygraph examination to test the validity of his allegations. This is the actual form completed in Clawson's own handwriting in which he agreed to the examination. The examiner posed six questions to Clawson, two of which were pro forma. The other four questions, however, address specific particulars of the double murder. Questions three and four went straight to the heart of the matter. The examiner's notes indicate no perceived attempt at deception nor any physiological reactions indicative of being untruthful. During a recorded interview with authorities on February 17, 1976, detectives attempted to throw cold water on Clausen's confessions, citing a handful of discrepancies which had arisen. One of these discrepancies called into question whether or not Clawson could have even been in Morgantown on the date of the murders. A time card from his employer near Philadelphia indicated he was working on both January 18th and January 19th in 1970. According to the transcript, Clawson waffled a bit but held fast to his confession. During March of 1976, Clawson underwent no fewer than four hypnotic interview sessions, all of which were recorded and later transcribed. Under the guidance of Dr. S. Donald Babcock, Clawson opened up about his childhood, criminal past, family dynamic, and life in general. Again, Clawson continued to maintain that he had assaulted and then killed Merritt and Karen on January 18, 1970, going into details which are too graphic in nature to be described here. Curiously, during one hypnotic session, Clawson claimed to have lied about how he disposed of the severed heads, now claiming he had taken them to Fayette County and incinerated them, and only threw strands of their hair down the mine shaft in Point Marion. Although not 100% consistent, Clawson's repeated confessions eventually persuaded Monongalia County Prosecutor David Solomon of his guilt. On April 9, 1976, Eugene Clawson was indicted on two counts of first-degree murder by a Monongalia County grand jury. Clawson, who was incarcerated in New Jersey at the time, waived extradition. Three weeks later, he was sentenced to 15 years in prison for his conviction in New Jersey. The New Jersey legal proceedings delayed Clawson's extradition for over a month, during which time he apparently had a change of heart about his confession. On May 18, 1976, Clawson reportedly told West Virginia trooper D.M. Shade that he had begun to doubt his own recollection of events. He also is said to have stated that he wished to remain at the Rawway Adult Diagnostics and Treatment Center in New Jersey as he felt conditions there were more comfortable. He is also said to have stated that he had developed a dislike for Prosecutor David Solomon and, quote, was not going to make it easy for him, end quote. According to Trooper Shade, Clawson stated that he now planned to change his story and plead not guilty. On Wednesday, May 19, 1976, Eugene Clawson was arraigned in Monongalia County Circuit Court. Attorney L. Edward Friend was assigned to be his public defender. Six days later, on May 25th, After more than five months of proclaiming his own guilt, Eugene Paul Clawson pleaded not guilty to the murders of Karen Farrell and Merritt Malarick. Bond was denied, and a trial date was set for June 28th. During the 10-minute hearing, attorney Friend made a standard motion for discovery and opined that it would take him and his partner, Michael Tomaski, several weeks to prepare. 
In turn, Prosecutor Solomon requested that Clawson undergo pre-trial examination at the West Virginia University Hospital. He opined that the examination, set to begin that same day, shouldn't take any longer than a day and a half to complete. Ironically, Clawson's was not the only case of double homicide originally scheduled for the circuit court's spring term. 80-year-old Fuller Birch of Hildebrand, West Virginia, was also indicted for the shooting deaths of his wife and daughter. Troopers McCabe and Shade transported Clawson to West Virginia University Hospital on May 26th. The following day, he was examined by psychiatrist Donald C. Carter. Two days later, in what was a blow to the prosecution, Dr. Carter determined that Eugene Clawson was not competent to stand trial and recommended further treatment followed by a reevaluation. In his letter of the same date, Dr. Carter stated that he felt Clawson was suffering from both paranoid schizophrenia and Kleinfelter's syndrome. On June 1st, attorney Friend filed a motion for a continuance. The continuance was granted, and pursuant to Dr. Carter's diagnosis, Clawson was taken from the West Virginia University Hospital and transported to the Weston State Hospital for a period of, quote, not more than 20 days, end quote. Staff shortages and other issues would result in Clawson's stay at Weston being extended far longer than 20 days. The original trial date of June 28th came and went. Clawson remained in the Weston State Hospital until July 12th, when it became increasingly apparent that the facility was ill-equipped to carry out the necessary treatments. On July 21st, Eugene Clawson was thoroughly examined by psychiatrist R. O. Pletcher and psychologist Robert Bell at the Central District Mental Health Center in Clarksburg. In their determination, Clawson was competent to stand trial. On August 18th, Dr. Carter again examined Eugene Clawson and noted that his condition had significantly improved and also declared him fit to stand trial. It is interesting to note that in Dr. Carter's letter of August 18, 1976, he states the following concerning the date of January 18, 1970. Mr. Clausen states clearly again that he does not remember that particular day and also that particular time span. While at the very beginning of the next paragraph, he adds... Mr. Clausen continues to see his confession as a contrived, manipulative instrument on his part to move the pessimistic status quo of his incarceration at the time he wrote it, a contrivance of his cellmate and himself that he felt at the time would go nowhere in terms of any type of arrangement in the state of West Virginia. On August 26, 1976, Judge Krieger ruled... The court therefore finds that the defendant understands the nature and consequences of the charges pending against him and could participate in any hearing or trial that may be held hereafter. On October 7th, as the revised trial date drew nearer, Clausen's attorney filed a motion for a change of venue, stating that an oversaturation of negative media coverage in the Morgantown area would tend to taint any jury pool. To accentuate this point, Numerous radio news bulletins broadcast by Morgantown radio station WCLG during April and May were presented. Judge Kiger considered the request, but ultimately determined that the passions and anger of the community had sufficiently cooled during the intervening six years. In his own words, quote, the knife edge of adverse publicity has dulled, end quote and that the past and current media reports were merely, quote, an enumeration of the occurrences, end quote. Attorney Friend's request was denied. During the lead-up to his trial, Clawson remained incarcerated in the Monongalia County Jail. The fall term of the Monongalia County Circuit Court was scheduled to begin on October 26th. The state of West Virginia versus Eugene Paul Clawson was first on the docket. At around 9 a.m. on Tuesday, October 26, 1976, the trial of Eugene Clawson commenced. 
The task of selecting a 20-person jury moved surprisingly quickly, with the task being completed just before the lunch recess. By 1.30 p.m., the newly renovated courtroom in the old Monongalia County Courthouse was filled to capacity by members of the media and a more than curious public. Prosecuting attorney David Solomon did not mince words and got right to the point in his opening statement. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, I will now open the evil window of death and relate to you what facts and circumstances the state of West Virginia will rely upon to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that Eugene Paul Clausen is guilty of the premeditated and willful murder of two young girls on Sunday night, January 18, 1970, in the lonely and silent woods of Mullingalia County. And we will further open this window and show that the defendant on that fateful night did deliberately and willfully murder those two beautiful co-eds by decapitating them after subjecting them to abuses and indignities beyond description and belief. In contrast, counsel for the defense, L. Edward Friend, took a more reserved and humble approach. Faced with the fact that Eugene Clausen's offbeat lifestyle and checkered past would likely work against him, Friend opted to head the issue off at the pass. He freely admitted Clausen's previous faults and missteps, but implored the jury to remember that their focus was on the charges at hand and the proceedings were not a popularity contest for Eugene Clausen. Now, very much of what Mr. Solomon said to you is true. Mr. Clausen is not what we would consider, what you and I would consider, a completely adjusted person. He's had problems since he was in grade school in Point Marion, and I imagine at some time the prosecutor will bring out some of the problems he's been in. He's been in and out of jail. It isn't the first time he's been in trouble. It isn't the first time he's been sitting in jail. The temptation will be, once you've read the horrible, degrading acts described by my client as written down and recorded, to want to punish him for something. And I don't care about that. But remember, we're here on the trial of murder. Separate the crime from what this person, as I've described him, says in these statements. I ask you, without arguing the case, in closing to listen to the evidence on behalf of my client. Listen to it. I ask you to be skeptical of evidence that violates your common sense. And I again ask you, don't make up your mind until you've heard everything, both the prosecutor's case and the defense. Most of what follows is based on the verbatim transcripts of the actual trial proceedings. The prosecution opted to proceed in chronological order beginning with the accounts from January 18, 1970. Speaking for the prosecution, Clarence Lewis and Paulette Burns related to the jury what they recalled about the events of that night. Their stories were much as had been reported in 1970. They met Karen and Merritt at the Metropolitan Theater, later walked with them from the theater to Willie Street, and minutes later saw both girls drive by in the front seat of a large white car with large fins. Neither saw Merritt or Karen actually enter the car, and neither got a particularly good look at the driver, only able to discern that it was a white male. During his cross, attorney friend asked Paulette if she recalled having given a statement in 1970 to the effect that the driver appeared to be older than Eugene Clausen would have been. Miss Burns, I'm reading from the statement that was allegedly taken from you at the state police barracks. The statement says that the driver, according to Miss Burns, appeared to be an older man, possibly 40 years old. Did you make that statement? I may have. It's been so long, I just don't remember. Do you deny at this time that you said, back in March of 1970, that the man was approximately or appeared to be an older man, possibly 40 years old? Do you deny saying that? I don't deny it. I may have. The scene next shifted to the morning of January 19th. 
Benny Palmer, still the chief of the Morgantown Police Department, testified that word of the missing girls first reached him by way of a telephone call from Westchester Hall. It was later confirmed by a call from the Dean of Women. He confirmed that an APB was sent out via teletype to the West Virginia State Police. The defense declined to cross. Sergeant John Falks with the West Virginia State Police recalled for the jury how he had photographed the location where Merritt and Karen's bodies were later found. He identified a set of photos he had taken. The prosecution moved to have the photos 4A through 4M admitted as evidence. Attorney Friend objected to photos 4D through 4L, stating that their graphic nature would result in a prejudice which would outweigh any benefits they may serve in depicting the overall crime scene. The photos in question included various in-situ views of Karen and Merritt's remains. It should be noted at this point that Mysterious WV attempted to obtain copies of the photos designated States Exhibits 4A through 4L. We were provided with only five color images which have thus far been shown. A second, more detailed request via the West Virginia Freedom of Information Act for the balance of the crime scene photos was denied. In a letter dated May 2, 2023, the state police advised Mysterious WV that the photographs in question were exempt from disclosure pursuant to the West Virginia Code, subsection 29B-1-4 A. Two. Taking issue with this determination, Mysterious WV, on May 10th of 2023, sent another FOIA to the West Virginia State Police, citing sections of the state code and relevant legal rulings, which we felt argued strongly against their position. It was respectfully requested that the West Virginia State Police reevaluate its decision. As of this airing, we have yet to receive any reply to this letter. The prosecution argued that the photos were essential in adequately portraying the overall crime scene as it was found. The defense again countered, stating that the fact that the girls were dead was not in dispute, and images of their remains were therefore superfluous. Judge Kiger overruled the objection, and all 14 photographs were admitted as evidence as were ten photos taken by Falks during Merritt and Karen's autopsies. This ruling by Judge Kiger would have major ramifications in the coming years. As another side note, the ten color photographs taken by John Falks during the girls' autopsies were located by Mysterious WV during a routine record search at the Monongalia County Circuit Court. The 8x10 photos were of such a graphic nature that only three could be redacted for presentation without blacking out at least 60% of the image depicted, and Mysterious WV has absolutely no intention of presenting them here. We will only state that seven of the images depict Karen Farrell's autopsy from arrival to internal examination, and three depict close-ups of Merritt Malarick's shoulders. The gruesome nature of their decapitation is clearly depicted. It should be noted that the Monongalia County Circuit Court did not object in any way to providing full-color copies of these images. Mysterious WV is most grateful for the court's cooperation, extended attention, and willingness to make available all materials still in their possession. Following the brief fracas over the photographs, the trial proceeded. Dr. Milton Hales, who performed the autopsy on Merritt Malarick, was next to the stand. After explaining the process by which the remains were identified, Prosecutor Solomon turned to the question of visible injuries and how they may have been inflicted. Dr. Hales stated that he felt it would have taken several blows from a heavy, sharp instrument to sever the cervical vertebrae. When asked if this could have been accomplished with a machete, Dr. Hales said that it could, though he did admit under cross-examination that he had also theorized the weapon could have been a hatchet-like implement. The defense inquired about references in Dr. Hales' report concerning the possibility of sexual assault. 
Quoting from said report, they asked about one line in particular, stating that, quote, The mucosal surface of the labia majora and minora is uniformly red with no signs of local trauma, end quote. Dr. Hales clarified by explaining this meant there were no signs of trauma, lacerations, or bruising to the external genitalia. Hales also explained that a histological examination revealed no trace of spermatozoa. Essentially, Dr. Hales testified that he was unable to say whether or not a physical assault had occurred as the absence of genital trauma was not necessarily indicative of nor inconsistent with such an assault. The rest of day one proceeded with little contention as the particulars of the search for the girls and the particulars of the crime scene examination were recounted. The defense briefly objected to the introduction of a pre-marked map on the grounds that highlighted roadways and the locations of evidence may be misleading to the jury without first being addressed in testimony. The objection was overruled, with the proviso that the depictions be later linked with corresponding testimony. Descriptions of the search and crime scene investigation continued on day two, again with little or no objections. Indeed, most of the testimony given during the morning was routine and primarily recounted and added some details to events which had already been made public. Later in the day, Dr. Hiroshi Suzuki, who had performed the autopsy on Karen Farrell, took the stand. Much like Dr. Hales, he testified that he felt the decapitation was the result of heavy blows with a sharp implement, though he was unable to state with certainty whether the implement had been a machete or other cutting tool. When the proceedings turned to Eugene Clausen and his alleged actions on January 18, 1970, the legal sparks began to fly in earnest. On the afternoon of day two, October 27, 1976, the issue turned to the two on-the-record confessions given by Mr. Clausen. Midway through the day, Clausen, his attorneys, and the prosecution met in Judge Kiger's chambers to review the audio recordings of the second confession. The question of whether or not the two confessions would be admitted as evidence turned the adversarial process between the prosecution and defense into a near shouting match. During the afternoon session, Prosecutor Solomon cited five separate witnesses, including Trooper Shade, Major Hall, and Officer McCabe. Solomon and friends soon locked horns again over alleged discrepancies between the audio recording and the transcript of the February 17th confession. The confession shows the defendant wanted an attorney but didn't get one. There are dozens of places where the tape and transcription differ. The transcription is reasonably accurate and correct and the defense has had copies for weeks. The tape is available to them and has been. They have not made themselves available to it. They are basing their objections on their own assertions. Attorney Friend made a motion to have all references to explicit acts between Clausen and the girls be omitted from the record, as no evidence corroborating the assertions existed. The motion was overruled by Judge Kiger. After an afternoon of intense arguments by both sides, Judge Kiger rendered his decision. Having in mind what the court has heard from witnesses and the submission made in chambers with regard to this confession, the court believes it is sufficient to warrant submission to the jury. The statement appears to have been voluntarily made and from that standpoint is admissible. With that decision, day two came to an end. The majority of day three, October 28, 1976, was devoted to a reading of the two confessions made by Eugene Clausen on January 13th and February 17th. Trooper Shade undertook the unenviable task of reading all 73 pages of the first confession. During the afternoon session, the audio tape of the second confession was played for the jury, who had also been provided with transcripts to follow. The majority of the information related in each of these confessions was presented in part one of this feature. 
the morbid account of Clausen's assault, murder, and mutilation of Merritt Malarick and Karen Farrell are too graphic in nature to be described in detail on this forum. Clausen did state that following the physical assault, he allowed both Merritt and Karen to put their clothes back on before forcing each of them out of his car. He claimed to have entertained the idea of letting the girls go, but ultimately determined that the chances of them being able to identify him was too great. Clausen said he next shot each of the girls, retrieved a machete from under the driver's seat of his car, and proceeded to remove each girl's head. He next drove around a meandering route from Owl Creek to Point Marion, discarding Merritt and Karen's possessions along the way and accidentally driving south to Grafton in the process. Clausen attributed any vagaries of his account to his ingestion of LSD and smoking of reefer cigarettes. Day 4, October 29, 1976, presented the prosecution with its greatest hurdle, directly tying Eugene Clausen to the Point Marion, Pennsylvania site, where he claimed to have disposed of both severed heads. No bone or skulls had been found at this location. However, two distinct types of human hair, 120 strands in total, had been recovered. West Virginia State Police hair analysis Steve Kanick testified that he could confirm that the hairs had come from two different Caucasian humans. The sex of the contributors could not be determined. At the time of the murders, Merritt Mallorick was said to have had brown hair with a streak of blonde. Karen Farrell was said to have had bleached blonde hair with brown roots. Steve Kanick testified as follows. A total of 106 hair sections were consistent with each other. These hairs were originally medium to dark brown. There was, on the tip ends, bleach and auburn tint over the bleach and brown. It was my opinion, from the characteristics in each division, that they could be from two different human heads. During cross-examination, Kanick did not hide the fact that he could not say with 100% certainty from whom the hairs had come, only that they appeared to be consistent with descriptions of Karen and Merritt's hair. After describing the lengthy search for the heads at the Point Marion location, the prosecution rested. Late on Friday, October 29th, Clausen's defense team swung into gear. The first to be called was Clausen's former superintendent from the Weyerhaeuser factory outside of Philadelphia, Francis J. Foley. Foley presented company records which purported to show that Clausen had worked on Sunday, January 18, 1970, and several days thereafter. The trial concluded its first week with the promise that Clausen himself would take the stand on Monday, November 1st. On the stand, Clausen stuck to his revised claim that he had fabricated his confession in a misguided attempt to gain freedom in New Jersey and later flimflam the West Virginia legal system into acquitting him based on an anticipated polygraph test. He claimed he learned the facts of the co-ed murders from a December 1975 issue of Detective Magazine and an article written by Spencer Trent, the case of the headless co-eds. I made the confession because I've been sitting in jail for two years. In December 1975, I read two articles in a magazine. If I could make them believe I committed the crime, I felt I could later prove my innocence. All the facts I used in the confession were in that book. Copies of the magazine were distributed to the jury, and Clausen went on to read the nearly seven-page article into the record. Following an objection by Assistant Prosecutor Mike Margo, Judge Kiger advised the jury that the contents of the article may not be accurate, but was being presented as the alleged source of Clausen's knowledge concerning the murders. Clausen repeated that he was working at the Weyerhaeuser plant in Philadelphia on January 18, 1970, and never came to Morgantown. The defense adopted a strategy whereby it would highlight inconsistencies in Clausen's two confessions. 
To that end, three law enforcement officers next took the stand. Trooper Preston Gooden, Sergeant L.L. Harold, and Major R.M. Hall. Trooper Preston Gooden testified that he was especially surprised at the relatively neat condition of Merritt and Karen's clothing when they were found. Her coat was still on her and very neat. Her pinstripe slacks were very neat. Her blouse was fully buttoned and neat. Everything even down to a pack of cigarettes tucked into her waist of her slacks. You say you have investigated rapes and murders. Did you find any evidence of sexual molestation? I did not. Harold also testified that he observed no signs of physical assault, and Gooden went on to state that he did not think the girls' heads had been removed by a machete, but rather by a hatchet. Major Hall testified that his doubt about Clausen's guilt stemmed from his February 1976 statement, during which he claimed Clausen was evasive and vague. The barrel sight was not clear from his explanations. I tried to get him to go into more minute detail. Did he try to evade you? Yes, he did. How did he react? He detested it because I wanted more detail. The following day, November 2nd, the trial took a rest as West Virginia and the rest of the United States went to the polls to determine their leaders for the next four years. In West Virginia, Moore was out and Rockefeller was in. In Washington, Ford was out and Jimmy Who was in. Wednesday morning, both the prosecution and defense were back in the Monongalia County Courthouse. Unlike the cliffhanger from the night before, this day would prove to be anticlimactic. Following a brief questioning of Merritt Malarick's former boyfriend, the defense rested its case, just ten minutes after court had been convened. The prosecution had called over 40 witnesses. The defense had called six, the defendant included. Following the rebuttal portion of the trial, during which various aspects of the crime scene were hotly debated and compared, the prosecution again rested its case. At 11 a.m. on Tuesday, November 4, 1976, the closing statements began. In defense of Eugene Clausen, attorneys Tomaski and Friend stressed the similarities between the 1975 magazine article as well as the distances and times involved. Edward Friend cited 27 instances where Clausen's two confessions and the detective magazine article lined up. He argued that it was all but impossible for Clausen to have left Philadelphia during the afternoon of January 18, 1970, driven completely across the state and commit the murders during the established timeline, a drive that Friend claimed would have taken eight hours to make. Concerning the hairs found at the Point Marion location, Friend stressed that the hairs recovered appeared to have been cut and not pulled from the scalp by force and were bleached and dyed, unlike Merritt and Karen's hairs, each said to have been color rinsed. The state says that Eugene Clausen did it and is now trying to fit him into the crime. They want to put the square peg into the round hole. For the prosecution, Assistant Prosecutor Mike Margo stressed the facts and the evidence which the state had presented. Lawson's confessions, the machete found at his brother's home where he claimed to have left it, and the hairs from two different persons found in Point Marion. In a dramatic moment, which he would later come to lament, Margo held up several graphic photographs of Karen Farrell and Merritt Malarick passionately stating that they had once been young, healthy girls. With an accusatory finger, Margot labeled Clausen a liar and said he recounted his confession for the simplest of reasons. He is lying because he doesn't want to go to jail. He's a sly one. The defense spoke of a 1973 article where he supposedly first learned about the murders, but they produced no article from 1973. Here again, Margot would later come to regret this final line, as it was later shown that a lengthy article concerning the murders had indeed appeared 
in the February 1973 issue of True Police. Prosecutor David Solomon fired the final barrage. The citation of 21 additional points described by Clausen, which did not appear in the December 1975 Detective magazine. Solomon cited the machete, the absence of a bra and underwear from Merritt Malarick's body, the locations where he had tossed many of the girl's possessions, and human hairs being found at the location where Clausen claimed to have disposed of the severed heads. And, perhaps the most damning of all, Clausen's description of the two individuals walking with Merritt and Karen on the night they were killed. Clausen stated that the male and female he observed on Willie Street were black. Paulette Burns and Clarence Lewis were both black, a fact which appeared in neither the 1973 nor the 1975 magazine article. In a final flash of dramatics, Solomon turned to Clausen and also leveled an accusatory finger. I charge you, Eugene Paul Clausen, with the brutal murders and condemn you for your evil act and your moral debaseness. With that, 12 of Eugene Clausen's peers retired to decide his fate. The time was 1.38 p.m., November 4, 1976. At 2.45 p.m. the following day, the jury returned its verdict. Guilty of first-degree murder with no recommendation of mercy, the strongest available punishment under West Virginia law. Clausen's attorneys wasted no time in filing an appeal. Among other things, attorney friend contended that the admission of the graphic photos into evidence had been inflammatory and prejudiced the jury against Eugene Clausen. On November 12th, the day Clausen was to be sentenced, Judge Kiger overruled the motion to set aside the verdict and sentenced Clausen to life in prison with no chance of parole. He would begin serving his sentence in West Virginia after his sentence in New Jersey was complete. Friend made it publicly known that he intended to fight the verdict. On July 8, 1977, he filed an official appeal to the West Virginia Supreme Court in Charleston. In his appeal, he stated that, in addition to the graphic photos, the denial of a change of venue had denied Clausen a trial by an impartial jury of his peers. On Monday, November 7, the West Virginia Supreme Court unanimously voted to review the conviction of Eugene Paul Clausen. The court, however, did not move swiftly. Nearly three years later, on September 23, 1980, the West Virginia Supreme Court issued its ruling. The court stated that it found error in the conviction of first-degree murder. Clausen's conviction was reversed and annulled. In July of 1981, the Monongalia County Circuit Court ruled in favor of a change of venue. Both the state and defense agreed on Elkins, the county seat of Randolph County. The state was also prohibited from entering into evidence any post-mortem images of Merritt Malarick or Karen Farrell. Clausen, still serving an 18-year sentence in New Jersey, would have to be returned to West Virginia once again. Clausen's retrial was originally scheduled to begin on July 20th, 1981. However, in a near carbon copy of the events of five years previous, circumstances would again intervene. On July 16th, the state itself was forced to ask for a continuance when a new wrinkle appeared in the case. Corporal Shade, who had participated in the original investigation, had been informed that the location in Point Marion, Pennsylvania, where human hairs had been recovered, had, at some point, been used as a dumping area for garbage. A routine check of the residents in the area revealed that one of them, Miss Donna Martin, was a licensed beautician and had been cutting the hair of her neighbors since 1971. This development called into question the contention that the hairs recovered in 1976 belonged to Merritt Malarick and Karen Farrell. The only way to settle the matter was a thorough process of elimination. 
current and former clients of Miss Martin were located and allowed to view the specimens of hair found at the Point Marion location. Martin herself recalled for law enforcement what she remembered about the color and length of the hair she had cut. One by one, the possible contributors of the hair were ruled out, and Miss Martin herself attested to the fact that until 1979, she routinely burned all discarded hair before it was taken to the Con School garbage dump. The hairs found in 1976 had not been burned. It was ruled that the follicle evidence could be presented to the jury just as it had been in 1976. By early October, the preparations were nearly complete. Much of the original dramatis personae from 1976 would again be called upon to take the stage. L. Edward Friend was back for an encore as Eugene Clausen's attorney. Prosecuting attorneys Thomas Newbra and Robert Stone were selected to present the state's case. Presiding over the proceedings was Circuit Judge Jack R. Newsom, a unique individual to say the very least. Newsom, who was not a slave to formality or protocol, was described by a UPI reporter as having an easy country manner, but one who was still firm on his rulings. Eleven years had now passed since Merritt Malarick and Karen Farrell had been murdered, and the atmosphere in the Randolph County Courthouse clearly reflected the cooling of emotions. A case in point came when Sergeant William Mitchell with the West Virginia State Police was asked how long he had been in law enforcement. When Mitchell replied, quote, 22 years, one month, and 28 days, Assistant Prosecutor Robert Stone couldn't help but quip, quote, and how many hours, end quote. Levity aside, the case at hand was still a serious matter, and several key points of contention would arise early, laying the rails for what was to come. For the most part, the 1981 retrial was very similar to its 1976 precursor. One notable exception was the newly permitted presence of the news media in the courtroom. Judge Newsom, recognizing the high-profile nature of the case, did what he could to accommodate but did draw the line when it came to distractions. I don't care how many cameras you have as long as you don't use any more artificial light than we have here in the courtroom. On Monday, October 26, 1981, five years to the day from the start of the first trial, the retrial of Eugene Paul Clausen began. Clausen, now 41 years of age, was led handcuffed from the county lockup to the Randolph County Courthouse. That day, a jury of nine women and three men were chosen. Judge Newsom made it clear from the start that the focus was to be on accuracy rather than speed. We're not interested in saving time. We're interested in getting this man a fair and impartial jury to try this case, and that's what we'll do. There then followed a lengthy back and forth about what evidence could be included. It was again agreed that the hair samples were allowed, however, any expert testimony was to be confined to identifying them as human and coming from two Caucasian individuals. Former state police chemist Steve Kanick again provided this service along with a somewhat detailed dissertation on the FBI procedure for hair analysis. Friend, during his opening statement, implored the jurors to put aside any predispositions towards guilt simply because his client had confessed. He promised to prove that everything to which Clausen confessed was torn straight from the pages of the 1975 detective magazine. Assistant Prosecutor Stone countered that he intended to make the five confessions to be presented the core of his case. The parade of witnesses commenced. 
Paulette Burns, now Paulette King, again told of what transpired on the night of January 18, 1970. Told of she and her boyfriend walking from the Metro Theater to Willie Street and of seeing Merritt and Karen driven by in a large cream-colored car. As members of the jury were residents of Randolph County and not Morgantown, certain geographical designations required slightly more clarification as opposed to 1976. Benny Palmer, still chief of police of the Morgantown Police Department, again recounted how he learned that Marin and Karen were missing and how the information was circulated. Steve Trickett, now 25 years of age, again described how he happened upon Merritt Malarick's purse along U.S. Route 119. Preston Gooden, who would again testify for both the prosecution and defense, next took the stand. He, too, repeated essentially the same things he had said in 1976. In fact, throughout the many days of direct and cross-examination, the only major difference between 1976 and 1981 was the number and nature of crime scene photographs presented. This time, only five were shown, and none depicted the scene in an overly graphic nature. The state once again argued that Clawson had confessed to things which he could not possibly have known had he not been present. The defense countered and maintained that Clawson had fabricated the tale based on the December 1975 magazine article. The state countered, saying that the testimony of fellow inmate Felton Harp indicated Clawson had first spoken of the matter during the summer of 1975. The defense called Harp's credibility and motivations into question. In the end, however, there was again no smoking gun, no eyewitness to the crime, nothing to tie either the prosecution or the defense's cases up with a nice bow on top. The question was again left for the jury to decide. Here, there was a slight change in the outcome. Lawson was again found guilty of murder in the first degree. However, eleven years may indeed have cooled the passions of some, as this time around the jury recommended mercy. In January of 1982, Clawson, through his new attorney, Daryl Ringer, again filed notice of an intent to appeal. The official appeal was not filed until March 24, 1983, and was denied the same day. Over the next 12 years, Clawson maintained an on-again, off-again contact with the circuit courts, but never again formally appealed his conviction. In fact, in 1995, he appeared to have again turned a 180 and once more declared himself guilty of the double murders. He said that drugs had affected his mind to the point that he simply didn't know what he was doing. Now a self-described Krishna, Clawson withdrew his latest petition for a habeas. By this point, Clawson had served out his sentence in New Jersey and had been transferred to the West Virginia State Penitentiary in Moundsville. Preston Gooden, by then sheriff of Berkeley County, West Virginia, was unimpressed asserting his belief that Clawson was merely starved for attention. Right up to his death in 2009, Preston Gooden refused to accept Clawson's guilt. When the West Virginia State Penitentiary closed, Clawson was transferred to the Mount Olive Correctional Facility. Eugene Paul Clawson died in 2009. Leon Edward Friend was later nominated federal bankruptcy judge for the Northern District of West Virginia. At the federal courthouse in Wheeling, the L. Edward Friend bankruptcy courtroom was dedicated in 2010. Friend retired in 2021. As of this writing, he resides in Naples, Florida. Judge Marvin Kiger, who presided over Clawson's first trial, retired from the legal profession shortly after its conclusion. 
He died in August of 1981. Judge Jack Newsom continued on as circuit judge in Randolph County until his retirement in 1991. He passed away in March of 1998. Benny Palmer, who put out the first bulletin concerning Merritt and Karen's disappearance, continued on as the chief of police in Morgantown until his retirement in 1985. He passed away on November 25, 2008, at the age of 79. Robert L. Bonar continued on as superintendent of the West Virginia State Police until January of 1977. He died far too young on January 20, 1979, at the age of only 53. Today, over 53 years later, the murders of Merritt Malarick and Karen Farrell remain a topic of conversation and often heated debate. The lack of the proverbial smoking gun in Eugene Clausen's convictions has left the door wide open for ongoing speculation, conspiracy theories, and outright revisionism. As was the case with Trooper Gooden, many simply refuse to accept the official record of events and proceed on as if Eugene Clausen's dual convictions never happened. To this, we can only reply with the following commentary. In one way of thinking, this is a positive as it virtually ensures that the memories of Merritt Malarick and Karen Farrell will not fade away anytime soon. On the other hand, the unwillingness to accept not one but two unanimous decisions by a jury of one's peers treads upon the narrow line separating healthy skepticism from self-willed denial. As the record now stands, Eugene Paul Clausen was twice convicted by 12 jurors, all agreed upon by both the prosecution and defense counsels. All objections to perceived errors committed during the 1976 trial were addressed by the highest court in West Virginia in 1980. Errors cited by this court were accepted and its directions adhered to during the 1981 retrial. Even without the inflammatory photographs, even with a change of venue, and even with the cooling of passions brought about by the passage of 11 years between crime and sentence, the unanimous verdict was still the same. Guilty. Despite this, it seems quite likely that the skepticism surrounding the co-ed murders will continue. As mentioned in part one, it is a case which simply has all the right ingredients for an engaging, gripping, and even educational story. Perhaps then the only real question left is why this intriguing tale has never been enshrined on either the large or the small screen. If it is still true that everyone loves a mystery, then the answer may be absurdly simple. The presence of a rather inconvenient ending.